<clears throat> Thank you and good morning. Since I won the coin toss, or is that lost the coin toss, and I'm going first, let me begin by trying to explain what I understand us to be doing here this morning. Uh, this is uh, being billed as a dialogue between Catholics and Protestants, and indeed it is, but, and I say this uh, with some regret, uh, we are not representative of all Catholics or of all Protestants. Today, both Catholicism and Protestantism are extremely diverse religious communities with seemingly little unity on either side. Let's set aside for just a few moments the question of the official teachings of our respective wings of the Christian religion. The fact is that most Catholics and most Protestants today do not have a firm, sound grasp of the Christian faith. The divine inspiration and authority of Scripture is denied in churches, seminaries, and Catholic and Protestant universities across this country and throughout the Western world. The historic Christian confession of Jesus Christ as the incarnate Son of God who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead is increasingly denied by theologians and ignored by churchgoers. Many churches today, there is greater interest in social issues and political causes of the left or the right than in spiritual issues or the cause of Christ. Now, all six of the Catholic and Protestant speakers that you will be hearing today are passionately concerned to turn this situation around. Each of us wishes to call the Church of Jesus Christ back to its roots, back to the faith once for all delivered to the saints and witnessed by the creeds of the early Church. Through, though Professor Samples and Father Pacwa, for example, later this afternoon are going to be disagreeing about the role of tradition and Church authorities, they agree, and all of us agree, that Scripture is the unerring, absolutely authoritative, and life-transforming Word of God. Dr. Logan and Father Grishel are going to express some disagreements about the full significance of the Eucharist, but they and all of us agree that in the celebration of the Eucharist, the risen Lord, Jesus Christ, is really present in and with his people, that Jesus Christ is alive and living in his people, in his church. Dr. Hahn and I are going to be disagreeing this morning about justification and the relationship between faith and works and grace. But we both agree, as do all the other speakers, that Jesus Christ is the only Savior of the world and that it is only by the mercy and grace of God in Christ that we can enjoy eternal life in God's forever family. So as we get into some of the specific differences between Catholics and Protestants, I would ask you to keep in mind this considerable common ground that we share. The subject in which I've been asked to speak this morning is salvation and more particularly justification. Now, as soon as this subject is brought up, a question arises. In acknowledging that we have differences about the doctrine of salvation, are we saying that those who differ with us can't be saved? In order to defend and proclaim the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ as we understand it, must we as Protestants regard Catholics as lost? And should Catholics return the favor? Now, the Catholic Church's teaching on this question is quite clear. According to the Second Vatican Council, which met in the 1960s, Protestants are separated brethren. Protestants are Christians who are missing the full riches of the Church, according to Catholicism, but Protestants are Christians, and they can, and in many cases are, in fact, saved. By the way, I should tell you that not all Catholics seem to have gotten this message. I once got a letter from a Catholic who insisted on the authority of his church that all Protestants were going to hell. Uh, I wrote back to him and pointed out that the Catholic Church says otherwise. And then he wrote back to me and he said, well, maybe you're not all going to hell, but you're all going to purgatory for a really long time. <laughs> That's probably my one funny story for the morning. 
I have to admit that some Protestants have more or less the same opinion of Catholics. There is a strong and vocal segment of conservative Protestantism well represented in this country that regards the Roman Catholic Church as a false church and Catholics as simply lost without qualification. Or if they admit that there might be Catholics who are saved, then they're not true Catholics. They're not real Catholics. They're really Protestants. They just don't know it. I'm sure this is insulting to Catholics, and it's also simply not true. In my opinion, uh, the main reason for taking this opinion, uh, this position, is the belief, which is sincerely held by many Protestants, that the Catholic Church teaches a false gospel of salvation by works, a gospel which no one can believe and be saved. I wish I could give you a simple yes or no, thumbs up or thumbs down to this question. All Catholics are saved, all Catholics are lost, black or white. I'm notorious for not giving such simple answers to such difficult questions. In my opinion, the situation is much more complicated than that. On the one hand, I have no doubt that there are many Christians in the Catholic Church who are just as much God's children, just as much saved by the grace of God in Jesus Christ as I am. I believe that my brother Scott Hahn is one of those persons. Charles Hodge, the great 19th century Calvinist theologian, expressed this conviction with great clarity. I quote Charles Hodge because he's writing over 100 years ago and he can't be accused of giving in to the ecumenical spirit of the age. Charles Hodge is no friend of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, adamantly opposed much of what the Roman Catholic Church taught, but this is what he had to say. Indeed, it is a matter of devout thankfulness to God that underneath the numerous grievous and destructive errors of the Romish Church, the great truths of the gospel are preserved. The Trinity, the true divinity of Christ, the true doctrine concerning his person as God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever, salvation through his blood, regeneration and sanctification through the almighty power of the Spirit, the resurrection of the body and eternal life are doctrines on which the people of God in that communion live and which have produced such saintly men as St. Bernard, Fenelon, and doubtless thousands of others who are of the number of God's elect. Every true worshiper of Christ must in his heart recognize as a Christian brother, wherever he may be found, anyone who loves, worships, and trusts the Lord Jesus Christ as God manifest in the flesh and the only Savior of men. Now, I think Hodge strikes a balance here that I find refreshing in today's religious climate. On the one hand, Hodge acknowledges in a very warm fashion as a Christian, anyone, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, or otherwise, who loves and trusts Jesus Christ as their great God and Savior. On the other hand, Hodge candidly points out that there are some grievous and destructive errors in Roman Catholic teaching, as he understands it. And this is what we need to do in our dialogue today, is to be honest about our disagreements, as well as honest enough to see where we actually agree. The fact is that bad doctrine can have devastating consequences. Now, we are saved by Jesus Christ, not by having the right doctrine about how we are saved by Jesus Christ. There's uh, no theology exam at the pearly gates. Good thing, too, I think most of us who are Christians would fail. But a misleading doctrine, nevertheless, can mislead. Now, if the Catholic Church's doctrine of salvation and justification is, in important respects, unbiblical and misleading, as Protestants historically have affirmed and as I am convinced is, in fact, the case, then there is good reason to be concerned about the salvation of those Catholics who, as a result of these misleading teachings, may miss the gospel. So I don't want to minimize that concern that Protestants historically have had, because I share it. Again, though, let me repeat that we are not saved 
by having the right doctrine of salvation. Protestants, and Calvinists often fall into this category, I should say, as one who is one, Protestants who presume that they are saved because they affirm the right doctrine of salvation are in big trouble themselves. You think you're going to be saved because you can pass that theology exam, uh, you're very much mistaken. We are saved by faith in Jesus Christ, not by our adherence to a creed or a confession, but to Jesus Christ. Still, the scriptures teach us doctrine for a reason. It's incumbent upon us to pay attention to sound doctrine, especially as it relates to the gospel of salvation, lest we mislead others or ourselves. Now, the Protestant doctrine of salvation that I'm going to be defending this morning is not the opinion of one man, say Martin Luther or John Calvin, as uh, much in respect as I hold those gentlemen, nor is it some general vague idea about what the gospel is that is shared by Bible-believing Protestants, but rather I propose to defend the doctrine of salvation that is common to the historic confessions of the major Protestant denominations dating from the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. I limit it to that period because after that time, Protestantism is infected with a mortal disease known as liberalism, which denies the supernatural character of Jesus Christ and of the work of salvation that Jesus Christ does, and which denies the reliability of Scripture, a disease, by the way, which has also infected many segments of Roman Catholicism. Now, these historic Protestant confessions are of various denominations. Lutheran confessions, such as the Augsburg Confession of 1530, the Heidelberg Catechism of 1563, the Formula of Concord in 1576, the Reformed or Calvinistic confessions, especially the Belgic Confession, 1561, the Second Helvetic Confession, of 1566, most of you probably haven't even heard of some of these, and uh, admittedly my favorite, the Westminster Confession of Faith of 1647. The Anglican Church has exactly the same gospel, the same doctrine of salvation in the 39 articles of the Church of England dating from 1571. And you find basically the same teaching in the Methodist Articles of Religion sometime later in 1784. The differences among these confessions on the doctrine of salvation are so minor that they're probably of interest only to theologians such as myself and Dr. Hahn. Now, there's a great deal to be discussed in looking at the doctrine of salvation and of justification. I'm going to bring out four key points that are found throughout these confessions, sometimes more elaborately explained than in other cases. But consistently, these four points emerge as crucial to the Protestant understanding of the doctrine of salvation and specifically of justification. The first point is that we are saved soli Christo. That's Latin for by Christ alone. We are saved by Christ alone. According to the Belgic Confession, it must needs follow either that all things which are requisite to our salvation are not in Jesus Christ, or if all things are in him, then those who possess Jesus Christ through faith have complete salvation in him. Therefore, for any to assert that Christ is not sufficient, but that something more is required besides him, would be too gross a blasphemy. For hence it would follow that Christ was but half a savior, Again, that's the Belgic Confession. Now, of course, Roman Catholics and Protestants agree Jesus Christ is the Savior. But what is distinctive about the Protestant understanding of Christ's role as Savior is that specifically with regard to justification, most clearly, Protestants insist that our righteousness our right standing with God is entirely and solely the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That Christ alone is our righteousness. 
and that this means exactly what it sounds like it means, that our righteousness, that is, our personal moral uprightness, our personal righteous character, our own righteous good works or attitudes, really are not the basis for our standing as children of God, as forgiven by God, as accepted by God in his mercy into his family. A biblical text that perhaps brings out the point that Protestants are trying to make is Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Paul the Apostle, speaking about giving up his confidence in his own righteousness as a Jew under the law, says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Historically, Protestants understand Paul here to be saying that the righteousness which I enjoy in my relationship to God through Jesus Christ is Christ's righteousness imputed to me or reckoned to me or placed to my account, credited to me as my righteousness, even though I did not originate it, I did not produce it, and I can't even live up to it in this life. So that is what Protestants historically have understood in their affirmation that salvation and justification are by Christ alone. Second, Protestants affirm that we are saved and justified by grace alone. You often hear the Latin phrase sola gratia, by grace alone. Now again, in Roman Catholic theology, Historically, salvation is also understood to be the work of God's grace. And I'm sure that uh, Scott and other Catholics would even go so far as to say, by grace alone. But the way Protestants understand this confession of salvation by grace alone is distinctive. We understand the Roman Catholics to teach, maybe We'll get some clarification on this. But we understand the Roman Catholic Church historically to teach that the reason why grace saves us is at least in part the, due to the fact that grace is able to produce in us good works of our own. Not good works that we do in our own power, but good works that indeed are our good works. And that is at least in part on the basis of the reality of those good works that we can be considered saved. Protestants, on the other hand, hold that if we are saved by grace alone, then our works, not just the works we did before we became Christians or as non-Christians, but the works that we perform even as believers in Jesus Christ, imbued by God's grace, these works contribute nothing to our standing with God. They do not contribute to our salvation. They are instead the fruit of a saved relationship with God. The second Helvetic Confession, for example, says, and I quote, For we are saved by grace and by the benefit of Christ alone. Works do necessarily proceed from faith, but salvation is improperly attributed to them, which is most properly ascribed to grace. Then the Confession goes on to quote Romans 11.6. In Romans 11.6, Paul has this to say, if you have a Bible, it's okay if you turn to them, these passages with us. If it is by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Now that last part is crucial to understand the Protestant concern about the Catholic view of salvation. Protestants are concerned, and not just about the Catholic view of salvation, but various Protestant 
deformed understandings as well, that introduce work somehow into the equation as part of what constitutes us as saved people. The Protestant historically in, its, in their confessions have said, if you do that, grace is no longer grace. Again, we are not denying the importance of works. We're not denying the necessity of works as the result of a truly saved relationship with God in Jesus Christ. But we're saying that works do not contribute to that standing. Works do not support that standing. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Perhaps the most famous New Testament passage quoted to make this point is Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. Some people, of course, in their hurry, only quote 8 and 9, but I'm going to do all three verses here. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The Protestant understands this passage to be saying this. We are saved by grace, through faith, unto good works. And if you get that order out of whack, Protestants are concerned that you will detract from the grace of God distract people from the grace of God in their lives, and people will begin to trust in their works rather than in God's grace. Again, we are saved by grace, by grace alone. By the way, the word alone isn't here, but it's clearly implied. Come back to that point later. We are saved by God's grace exclusively. We do not contribute to it. But that grace is not just applied indiscriminately to the entire population of earth. It's applied to those people who have faith because God creates that faith in them by his gift. It's a gift of God. Even the faith is a work of God's grace. And this grace does not leave people unchanged. It produces in them the desire and the ability to do the good works which God created them to do. And if those good works do not show up one has every right to question the genuineness of the alleged faith. So we are saved by Christ alone, and we're saved by grace alone. Third, Protestants affirm that we are justified and saved sola fide, by faith alone, or through faith alone, as sometimes it's put. This is probably the most controversial and contentious aspect of the Protestant view of justification from a Roman Catholic perspective. In affirming that we are justified through faith alone, again, Protestants are not uh, saying that the justified person need not do any works. We're not saying that a person who claims to have faith but has no works is saved. The Westminster Confession of Faith puts it this way. Faith, thus receiving and resting on Christ and his righteousness, is the alone instrument of justification. Yet it is not alone in the person justified, but is ever accompanied with all other saving graces, and is no dead faith, but worketh by love. End of quote. So the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is representative of all the Protestant confessions on this point, affirms that we are justified through faith alone. That is, faith is the only instrument of our coming into that standing with God where we are considered right before God. It is our faith which connects us to God in that way, and only faith. But this faith through which we are justified is never alone, but it is always accompanied by all the other saving graces of God in Jesus Christ, including the new birth, including the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, uh, the beginning of the work of sanctification, conforming us to the image of God's beloved Son, and so forth. All of these things accompany the grace of justification. So if you have heard, Protestants, 
that it isn't necessary for a saved or justified person to produce good works. It's recommended but not required. You've been listening to a deformed interpretation of the Protestant gospel. Now, the Heidelberg Catechism, to reinforce this point, says that it is impossible that those who are implanted into Christ by true faith should not bring forth fruits of righteousness. In other words, faith doesn't merely acknowledge intellectually that Jesus is the Savior. Faith implants us into Christ. Faith rests on Christ, trusts in Christ. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding between Catholics and Protestants on this point. It's very easy for both sides, and I'm not saying this is only a misunderstanding on one side, to hear faith alone and think, well, that means all you have to do is subscribe to the doctrine. All you have to do is mentally agree that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Just sign on the dotted line. That's all it takes. But that's not what Protestants mean, and that's not what Protestants understand Paul or other New Testament writers to mean when they talk about being saved or justified on the basis of faith. Rather, we understand faith to be a commitment to Jesus Christ as our Savior, a faith that is a commitment of the heart, a trust, a reliance, placing our confidence, our hope in Him alone. Now, folks, if you have that kind of faith, you're going to want to do what Christ wants you to do. You're going to want to obey Christ. You will follow Christ as a disciple and not merely intellectually agree, oh, yeah, he's Jesus, the Son of God. Yeah, I know that. I was taught that in Sunday school. But rather, you will be living your life for your Savior. So the Protestant view of justification through faith alone is not easy believism. It is not uh, just say after me, repeat the magic words, and on your way you may go. It is rather stop living your life as if you were God, as if you could justify yourself by your own good works, and put your faith in the only one who can save you, in Jesus Christ. Give your life to him. Protestants, when they say that, need to be sure that they mean it literally that we are, in fact, entrusting our souls to Jesus Christ. Again, on this doctrine of what faith means, the Westminster Confession of Faith says, the principal acts of saving faith are accepting, receiving, and resting upon Christ alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. So really, from a Protestant perspective, the whole doctrine of salvation and of justification flows from this single affirmation, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. The fourth point is that we are brought to faith and sustained in faith primarily. Now, not exclusively, so this is not another only. This is, this is a primarily through the ministry of the Word. Now, in Roman Catholic Theology and in Roman Catholic practice, historically, it is primarily the sacraments through which faith is created and sustained in the life of the Catholic. The understanding is that the Word, of course, must also be there, but primarily it is the sacraments. A justifying grace is imparted in Roman Catholic thought in baptism, and it is sustained through the sacraments, especially of penance and the Eucharist. Now, although Protestants affirm the validity and the importance of baptism and the Eucharist in the Christian life and worship, and we affirm that they do help to sustain our faith and to, uh, to help us develop in our faith, Protestants affirm that it is primarily the Word of God which creates and sustains faith in the life of a Christian. A scripture text that's perhaps a, a very popular one in this point is Romans 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. 
So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ, that is, the word about Christ, the message of salvation in Jesus Christ. King James Version says the word of God, but of course it really is the same thing, because that's what the word of God is about. It's about Christ. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of God, the word of Christ. So Protestants historically affirm, as again we find in the Westminster Confession of Faith, that the grace of faith is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the word, by which also and by the administration of the sacraments and prayer it is increased and strengthened. Now, I've only gotten through about uh, half my presentation and I have about four minutes left, but I do want to say a few closing words about the biblical basis of this doctrine of justification. You'll find the primary text for Protestants on this point in Paul's epistle to the Romans. Now, we're probably going to get into this a little bit more in the dialogue part, but the epistle of Paul to the Romans is Paul's magnum opus. It is his major work of exposition of his gospel. He makes that quite clear at the beginning and the end of the book. And so it is natural to turn to this book uh, by the New Testament's greatest theologian uh, and look at what he has to say about the doctrine of salvation. I cannot even begin to get into all of what I'd like to on this point, but let me draw your attention to a couple of texts. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. From start to finish, the Christian life is a life of faith. And insofar as my Roman Catholic brothers and sisters understand and affirm that, I count them as Christians. But this is the critical point that I wish to emphasize here, is that the gospel is a message of salvation for everyone who believes. Again, not merely intellectually agrees with the doctrine, but who believes in Jesus Christ, who trusts in Jesus Christ. Romans 3.28 one of the most hotly debated texts between Catholics and Protestants. Paul says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. You may remember I mentioned Ephesians 2 says that we're saved by grace. It doesn't actually add the word alone, but it's implied. Protestants historically have maintained the word alone is also implied here, that we are justified by faith alone apart from works of the law. Now again, that alone, Protestants do not understand that alone to mean you don't have any good works to show for your faith. What they mean is the justification is based on the faith, not on the works. The works flow from the life of faith. One more passage, I think I'm just about out of time, and that is Romans 4, verses 3 through 5. What does the scripture say? And this is about Abraham. Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. So Paul is understood here by Protestants is telling us, stop trying to work your way into justification and start believing your way, just as Abraham trusted God, believed God, and that was reckoned to him as righteousness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richie, and thank you, Rob. I'm very grateful for this dialogue. I'm especially grateful that it is a dialogue and not a debate. You might wonder, what's the difference? In a debate, it's like this. If I want your thoughts, I'll give them to you. Whereas a dialogue is designed to be an exchange of ideas based upon diplomacy. And you might know how Reader's Digest defines diplomacy as the art of letting someone else have your own way. So pray for spiritual diplomacy here.
In any case, it's so important to hear from both sides before forming our judgments. It reminds me of a story of a priest who was traveling late one night on a bus, and he was alone, and then the door opened, and this poor drunk stumbled in. He sat down on the seat right in front of the priest, picked up an old newspaper, sat up straight, moaned and groaned. A moment later, he turned around and asked the priest, he said, Father, do you, do you know what causes arthritis? The priest couldn't resist the opportunity to set this slob straight. Yes, too much drinking, loose living, carousing with degenerates. That's what causes arthritis. Oh, the drunk said, I, I was just reading in the paper here that the Pope's got arthritis. <laughs> so one needs to be careful <laughs> before forming judgments prematurely. <laughs> So instead of launching into a critique, an assault, or attack, I'd like to build on the common ground that has been laid clearly and truthfully by Rob about faith and justification, and then address the best way we can go about handling our differences. We have heard that faith is our consent to God. Faith is our reception of God's life. Faith is my consent to God who opens himself to me and offers a covenant through Christ. It's a lot like a marriage between two persons that's established by exchanging consent. But can you picture on the wedding day the bride's reaction when she hears the groom announce afterwards Honey, we were married by consent alone. She'd probably wonder, what does that mean? On the one hand, if my new groom simply means consent as opposed to coercion, okay, fine, that's true, of course, and somewhat obvious, a bit one-sided in the legal direction, perhaps, but uh, no problem. On the other hand, if he meant by consent alone, Okay, now you've got my consent. You got the wedding in the church. Your parents were there. You should be happy. Now you better be satisfied because my consent is really all. You asked for all you needed and all I give. That would be a falsification of that to which he gave consent because in the covenant of marriage you consent to love. You consent to a covenant of love that is mutual, that is exclusive, that is permanent, and that is fruitful. And that is an analogy to what faith consents to with Christ. Our soul enters into a nuptial union, a marital covenant with Christ the groom, a union that is permanent, mutual, exclusive, and fruitful. Now, I admit that there are some guys out there probably who mean the second thing when they say consent alone. And so faith alone can be an acceptable expression, but at the same time we ought to be willing to acknowledge that it's ambiguous, potentially misleading, and so not entirely helpful. Either the alone in faith functions as an adverb that modifies the verb justify or else it functions as an adjective and it modifies the word faith. If the sola in sola fide, if the alone functions as an adverb modifying the verb justify, it means that we're only justified by faith. Without faith you cannot be justified. And this is a proposition that every Roman Catholic can affirm and must affirm, and not simply affirm, but sing aloud with St. Thomas, who gave us a line in a great hymn that goes, Sola fide sufficit. Only faith can suffice. 
And it's a hymn sung with reference to Christ's presence in the Holy Eucharist. Because the mind cannot deduce Christ's presence, nor can the senses empirically verify it. Only faith suffices. And so Catholics can join with Protestants in affirming this adverbial sense of sola fide. Not by way of reluctant concession, I should add, but by joyful co-affirmation. But in that case, sola fide is true, but it's not new, much less revolutionary. On the other hand, if the alone is meant to function as an adjective modifying the noun faith, faith by itself, in that case, sola fide is new, but it's not true. Rob has clarified what the Westminster Confession and the Reformed Calvinist tradition affirms clearly, faithfully, precisely, and I'm glad because this is substantial common ground. Now, there are other Protestants who understand the alone in an adjectival sense, and we might be able to address that as well, but I think to further the dialogue here, we're going to focus on what we should do with this adverbial sense of sola fide, only through faith are we justified. In any case, I do think it's a little bit like the bridegroom who said consent alone because of its ambiguity. Why do I bring it up in these terms? Well, because a divorce has occurred. Almost five centuries ago, a divorce occurred in the 1500s between Protestants and Catholics, and like all such cases, both parties tend to blame each other. And in truth, both sides are right, which implies both sides are also wrong. Both sides share fault. And now almost five centuries and 20,000 denominations later, we have to ask ourselves a hard question. Was the divorce a real solution? Or has the solution proven to be itself worse than the problem? like cutting off your head to stop a nosebleed. It's proven to be a cure that kills. It kills our witness to the world. It kills our fulfillment of Christ's high priestly prayer that they may all be one even as thou, Father, art in me and I am in thee, that the world may believe. The world now has reasons to doubt because of this great divorce. It kills our efforts in battling countless evils as mutual allies as well. And I'm grateful for Rob sharing that quotation from Charles Hodge. I have some other statements from some favorites of his and mine. Here's a statement by Abraham Kuyper in his famous Princeton lectures that were later published as Lectures on Calvinism in which Kuiper said, Calvin in his day already acknowledged that as against a spirit from the great deep, he considered Romish believers to be allies. A so-called Orthodox Protestant need only perceive immediately that what we have in common with Rome concerns precisely those fundamentals of our Christian creed now most fiercely assaulted by the modern spirit. In this conflict now, Rome is not an antagonist but stands beside us as she recognizes and maintains the Trinity, the divinity of Jesus, the cross as an atoning sacrifice in the scriptures as the word of God, the Ten Commandments, and so much more. Therefore, let me ask, if Romish theologians take up the sword to do valiant and skillful battle against the same tendency that we ourselves mean to fight to the death, is it not the part of wisdom to accept their valuable help? And then the founder of Westminster Seminary, where Rob is doing his doctoral studies, wrote, How great it is the common heritage that unites the Roman Catholic Church with its maintenance of the authority of Scripture and its acceptance of the great early creeds to devout Protestants today. We would not indeed obscure the difference which divides us from Rome. The gulf is profound indeed, but profound as it is, it seems almost trifling 
compared to the abyss which stands between us and many ministers of our own church. Those were the words of J. Gresham Machen speaking about some of the Presbyterian confrères that gave him so much trouble. In any case, the question remains, was this divorce absolutely necessary? It was if the Protestant conception of sola fide, faith alone, is beyond rehabilitation, simply unbiblical and contrary to Catholic doctrine, which I don't believe it is. And I don't believe that Rob thinks so. And I don't think that's what Rob thinks. On the other hand, someone could say that the divorce was absolutely necessary because the Catholic conception is anti-biblical and totally beyond any hope of rehabilitation or even discussion, which Rob may insist upon, but I'd be surprised. I don't expect it because that's generally the position taken by professional anti-Catholics like Jack Chick or Bart Brewer or James White. But our differences are real and they're not small. But are they absolutely and necessarily irreconcilable? I don't believe that they are necessarily irreconcilable, but I do believe they will continue to seem like they are so long as we keep up the tone of the discussion of the last four or five centuries. Much like divorced spouses who spend most of their time arguing over who gets the house and who gets the car and who gets the furniture. If you get the house and I get the cars. If, if you get works and we get faith. If you get tradition and we have scripture. If you get merit then we have grace. We get justification. You got sanctification. You got the Pope, we got Billy Graham. <laughs> You've got Mother Teresa, but we've got Kay Arthur. You don't know her work? It's good. You've got Notre Dame, we've got Dallas Theological Seminary. <laughs> I'm not sure which one I would take. <laughs> By the way, I say that with great fraternal affection for very godly men at Dallas. Friends like uh, Eugene Merrill in Old Testament and others as well. It's great to be in their city discussing this. These are real differences, yes. But differences, I believe, that can be explained in terms of emphasis, different approaches, different perspectives, and widely varying concerns. But not necessarily mutually exclusive. This is especially true when real differences are rooted in real misunderstandings like they usually are in most marital squabbles. The differences reflect a certain amount of pride, a certain amount of competitiveness, and a great deal of deep hurt from the past. Like many spouses, Kimberly and I may be locked in some disagreement for hours, sometimes even days generally until one of us has the humility and love to look at it from the perspective of the other person's deepest concern. It may not be the concern that I think is the most important, but I never find her concern to be invalid. But seldom in the midst of the squabbling do I affirm the importance and validity of her concern. What I'm saying cannot serve as an excuse for sentimental, gushy, warm, fuzzy feelings of nostalgia, appeasement, equivocation, or ambiguity. In fact, we cannot afford to ignore the very real differences just as we cannot afford to exaggerate them or misunderstand them any longer. On the other hand, this doesn't call for just simply more cold, dispassionate, impersonal, hard, cold logic following Spock on Star Trek. We just need more deductive intellectuals debating these things in public performances to big crowds. As much as intellectuals like me enjoy those occasions. No, like any estranged couple, what is needed here is hard but careful, uncompromising, faithful, discerning dialogue, not only to speak the truth in love, but to hear and to listen to the truth on the other side 
that is spoken in love. Not simply to disagree agreeably, but to listen from the heart as well as from the head. And to allow ourselves to feel the force of what the other person is saying and then articulate it back so that that other person recognizes the fact that we have allowed ourselves to feel as well as to think through what their fears and concerns might be. And from 17 years of marriage with five kids, I tell you, it's never easy. Now what do you expect it to be after almost five centuries? I am convinced that it is our birthright as believers to have both faith and work, scripture and tradition, grace and merit, justification and sanctification, and all of the rest. They belong to Catholics and they belong to evangelical Protestants because they belong to Jesus Christ and we belong to him. If Rob was just simply a separated person, then we could treat each other simply as enemies, even though I'd still be obliged to love him because Jesus said, love your enemies. But it's the fact that we are brothers who are separated that makes it absolutely essential for us to figure out if there are ways for us as brothers who are separated to minimize that separation and then with God's help perhaps even to overcome it. We both love Christ, we long to know and do God's word and to please the Father and to live for his family. And as brothers in Christ, we need to acknowledge that our unity is greater than our differences and then build upon it. We also need to see our differences for what they are in view of this separated fraternity. They're a tragedy, but even more than a tragedy, the separation is a luxury that we can no longer afford especially in facing a culture of death or the rising tide of Islam, secularism, radical feminism, the breakdown of the family, and now in recent months, the emergence of a new hardened communist China, what one expert just called the other day, America's new enemy for a new century. Glory. We can no longer afford the luxury of allowing this separation to continue without addressing its deepest causes from a heart of compassion, love, and discernment. If we are in any way brothers who are separated, then what should be our deepest desire and longing? What would the Father in heaven think of brothers who can't eat together, who can't live together, and who don't even really care, and who only want to get together to argue? Now, I'm a father of five kids, and I... I been there, done that. <laughs> I know what it's like to see brothers, sons treating each other that way. Being Catholic myself, married with those kids, but also being a former anti-Catholic who took a very hard line stand against the Catholic Church as an anti-church, and being a former staunch evangelical Calvinist, I admit that I've got all sorts of vested interests in seeking reconciliation, but then who doesn't? But I don't think the answer is going to come through some sort of mesmerizing talk, some sort of uh, verbal hypnosis. All you Protestants, just close your eyes and repeat after me. There's no place like Rome. There's no place like Rome. <laughs> Auntie M is waiting. <laughs> it won't come through hypnosis. It will come through hard, long dialogue. The same way Kimberly and I work out our big differences, by shifting our focus away from our differences, but without ignoring them either, by concentrating on our common ground and our common concerns, and then by rethinking our differences in terms of those larger common commitments. This is especially important when Kimberly and I have fixated upon certain words or phrases that I use or that she uses, that we've used in the past to clobber each other, to hurt each other, to make our point at the other's expense. In this case, that's been going on for nearly five centuries. 
Not because there's no truth in the slogans like sola fide, but because they no longer serve the cause of truth or the cause of Christ. They, they mainly increase the potential for more misunderstanding. Now, mind you, I'm not some cheery-faced optimist. Oh, if we can just get the two of them back together in each other's arms, dancing to some medieval pre-reformational tune, oh, they'll be happy ever after. No way. But I'm also not a pessimist. Unless we were looking at this from strictly a human perspective. Because if we're looking to find some human means to do it, humanly speaking, there's no solution. But we're not dealing only in human terms. We're dealing with divine truth, divine wisdom, divine love. We're dealing with God's own family. An omnipotent father capable and desirous to do with us what is humanly impossible for us. But only in truth, which is the only basis for unity and the only basis for love. Because the father opposes the proud, God takes down the proud even when they're right. God opposes the proud even when they're right, and I might add, especially when they're right, because what it is they're right about is the truth of love. And so to present the truth of love in pride and arrogance is self-destructive. Back to this main and substantial point that Rob has so em emphasized so adequately, faith is my consent to God's love. But faith, as he pointed out, is also a gift from God. It isn't simply a gift of God's favor and mercy whereby he blots out my sins and forgives my transgressions. It is a gift of God's own life. It is an extension of the inner life of the Blessed Trinity from the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit. We are reborn. We become new creations and faith is the first act of a newborn child of God. And through that we come into the reality of the father-son bond that has existed from eternity within this mystery we love to affirm but seldom contemplate. The Blessed Trinity. Justifying faith is not the result of mere human effort. Faith is not what we do so we don't have to do anything else. But it is what we do when nothing else we do on our own works. In other words, faith is not a resignation from effort, but it does call for my resignation to the fact that my efforts aren't enough. Faith is not mere intellectual assent to propositions, sim simply because we agree with them or because they match our experience. Though we should agree and though they should match our experience, faith is essentially the consent of my will given to my Father because He is God, so I'll believe as true whatever He says because He says it. And He is God, and He is my Father, and He has recreated me in Christ through the Holy Spirit. So the object of my faith is proposition secondarily. It is a person primarily. It is the Father who sent the Son to give me the Spirit so I can believe. The act of faith then is not only assent of the intellect, it is the consent of the will to the person who addresses my mind. Faith is a gift of God, the Holy Spirit, which enables us then to give our consent, not just once, but continuously, not just passively, but actively. We consent to our covenant with Christ between my soul and its groom, between a sinner and a savior between a son and a father through the eldest brother, between us and our family. Christ paid a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. And that's why the Father sent the Son. And on my own, apart from Christ and the Holy Spirit, I'm nothing but an outcast rebel. And unknowingly, even a child of the devil... You Catholics should recognize this from the baptismal liturgy where you have prayers of exorcism prayed over the candidate about to be baptized, even with infants. I know that poses a problem for my Baptist brethren, but... In any case, on my own, I'm an outcast rebel who might try to port purchase my former dad's home and estate 
But salvation is not something sold at an auction to the highest bidder. And besides, I don't have the funds sufficient to buy even a single piece of furniture. Salvation is an inheritance given to and shared by family members. And the gift of family membership is given by God as a gift that is free, but it is not cheap. Justification, then, is the Father's declaration of my family standing, my legal status in the covenant family of God, by virtue of what Christ has done 2,000 years ago and because of what the Holy Spirit has done in recreating me, in giving me a new birth as a child of God. Okay, so... What am I proposing? I am proposing, in essence, that we Catholics need to acknowledge our failures and shortcomings. We need to become more thoroughly rooted in Scripture. We need to become more grounded in the Trinity. We need to become more active in authentic ecumenical dialogue with brothers and sisters in Christ who share so much. And at the same time, I would suggest that Protestants ought to rethink caricatures and proof texts, and that we can do this together. This misunderstanding is no less a problem for Catholics than Protestants. There's no less legalism among us than easy believism among them, and actually there's a lot of cross-pollination going in both directions. Both spouses have things to apologize for and then work the change. The Catholic position was summed up admirably by Pope John Paul II in very Veritatis Splendor, quoting St. Augustine when he said, God gave us the law so that we might seek His grace. Then God gave us grace so that we might be empowered to keep the law. God gave us the law, especially in the Old Testament where human nature had not yet received from the incarnate Christ the power of God through the Spirit to do what is otherwise humanly impossible for fallen men and women to accomplish. We couldn't fulfill the moral law on our own power. That also explained why God assigned certain ceremonial rituals because those rituals signified man's incapacity to fulfill even the moral law on his own power. So as a childhood ditty once said, the law was given so grace we'd seek, then grace was given so the law we'd keep. So the grace of God comes to us through Jesus Christ to, so that we can obey the law of God, we can keep the commandments. But grace does not make obedience easy. Grace simply makes obedience possible. And without the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Council of Orange, the Council of Trent, Vatican I, Vatican II, John Paul and Veritatis Splendor all affirm, without that supernatural grace flooding our souls, recreating us, we don't have a chance of fulfilling the covenant and keeping the moral law. Grace makes obedience not easy, but possible. And so, for the Catholic as well as the Protestant, we can affirm sola fide. It is a biblical concept. Sola fide is right, just to begin wrapping up here, sola fide is right if sola is an adverb, wrong if it's an adjective. Sola fide is a novel error if it's an adjective. It's a patristic commonplace. It's a medieval view. It is a Catholic dogma if it's an adverb. If sola fide is adverbial, then it means that there is no justification without faith. But if it's an adjective, it means there's no need for works in addition to faith. If sola is an adverb, then it applies to justification at every point along the way of the Christian life, and we're going to get back to that question. If sola is an adverb, then it applies to justification at every point along the way of the Christian life, not just at the beginning. If so, then justification is, like the faith that it's based on, an ongoing process, past, present, and future. 
Denying that both justification and faith involve an ongoing process puts one on a collision course with Paul in Romans 4 where he cites Abraham's faith in Genesis 15 when God declared him to be justified. But that's in Genesis 15, many years after Abraham had begun walking with God in faith, as Hebrews 11.9 points out. So Abraham is declared just in Genesis 15, not at the moment he began to believe, but well along the way in his life as a believer. Paul's argument then is that he was justified in 15, long before he was circumcised in 17, so the Judaizers are wrong in telling you Roman Christians that you've got to be circumcised if you want to be justified like Abraham was. Abraham is proof that isn't necessary. I would conclude by saying that sola fide ought to be mutually accepted and then retired from active duty. Because the only time the Holy Spirit inspired a New Testament writer to use the phrase faith alone is when the Holy Spirit moved the Apostle James to write, a man is not justified by faith alone but by works. But of course, James meant alone in the adjectival sense. And in Romans 3.28, Paul never said a man is justified by faith alone, apart from works of the law, not until a German translator inserted that word into Romans 3.28. And so I think it needs to be retired from active duty. James uses justification and faith much like Paul, but he uses works in a way totally unlike Paul. When James speaks of works, he says, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry. When Paul speaks of works, he's opposing those Judaizers who, were, who wish to circumcise these new Gentile believers. So Paul uses works against the Judaizers who are trying to get these folks circumcised. James uses the word works against these antinomians, these people who are anti-law, who try to convince people that salvation can be had apart from acts of love. In sum, the way out of our dilemma, if we're humble enough to accept it, is to follow Paul and James and the Council of Trent, Session 6, Chapter 4. I can only be what I am. I want to close with a, with a brief story that's true, and it illustrates what we share. Everybody felt it, a moment of eerie silence, a low rumble, and then the ground began shaking. Buildings swayed and buckled and then collapsed like houses of cards. Less than four minutes later, over 30,000 were dead from an 8.2 earthquake that rocked and nearly flattened Armenia in 1989. In the muddled chaos, a distressed father bolted through the winding streets, leading to the school where his son had gone earlier that morning. The man couldn't stop thinking about the promise he'd given his son many times. No matter what happens, Armand, I'll always be there. He reached the site where the school had been, but saw only a pile of rubble. He just stood there at first, fighting back tears, and then he took off, stumbling over debris, running toward the east corner where he knew his son's classroom had been. With nothing but his bare hands, he started digging, desperately pulling up bricks and pieces of wall plaster while others just stood by watching in forlorn disbelief. He even heard someone growl, Just forget it, mister. They're all dead. The father looked up, flustered, and replied, You can grumble or you can help me lift these bricks, but only a few pitched in and most of them gave up once their muscles began to ache. But the man couldn't stop thinking about his son. So he kept digging and digging for hours. Twelve hours, eighteen hours, thirty-six hours, until finally into the thirty-eighth hour he heard a muffled groan from under a piece of wallboard. He seized the board, he pulled it back, and he cried, Armand! And from the darkness came a slight shaking voice, Papa! Other weak voices began calling out as the young survivors stirred beneath the still uncleared rubble. Gasps and shouts of bewildered relief came from the few onlookers and parents who remained. They found 14 of the 33 students still alive. When Armand finally emerged, he tried to help dig until all his surviving classmates were out. Everybody standing there heard him as he turned to his friends and said, See, I told you my father wouldn't forget us. Our father won't forget us either. He'll dig us out of our sins 
And God willing, he'll dig us out of our separation. Thank you. At this point, Professor Bowman and Dr. Hahn will engage in a approximately 40-minute dialogue with each other on the issue of justification. Each speaker will have three questions to ask his counterpart, and they will be asked in alternative fashion. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. Uh, I agreed with a lot of it, as I'm sure that you anticipated. I do do disagree with some of the things that you said, and I can't resist uh, having at least one of my questions be uh, on a question of biblical interpretation, and I hope that... uh, uh, that this will be helpful to people. You mentioned that Paul uses the word works, and especially the phrase works of the law, a little bit differently than James uses the term works. Uh, James is talking about doing good things like uh, caring for your neighbor and feeding the hungry and so forth. Paul is talking about primarily ceremonial or ritual Jewish observances, as you understand it. I would just like to ask you in Romans 2, you were talking about Romans 3, 28, What about where the same word erga is used in Romans 2, verses 6 and 7, who will render to every person according to his works, uh, to those who by perseverance in doing good, uh, good works there again, verse 13 uh, as well uses the same word. Just like to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, because I interpret ergonamu works of the law later on in Romans 3 and 4 in a twofold sense with primary reference to the ceremonial rituals like circumcision that the Judaizers were trying to impose upon believers but which the church and Paul following the Jerusalem Council dispensed Christians from. It has that primary sense of the ceremonial law but it also has the secondary sense of the moral law which we would attempt to keep and fail to keep on our own power. In fact, as I pointed out in the talk, the ceremonial laws were given, such as circumcision and the animal sacrifices, precisely to symbolize to Israel their Adamic union, their their commonly shared original sin, and so their inability to keep the moral law. And so in the Old Covenant, the ceremonial signs, which were the works of the law, and I should add that this use of the phrase works the law is now found in the Dead Sea Scrolls in MMT or Mixat Mahasa HaTorah, uh, one of the most recently translated scrolls among the Dead Sea Scrolls. We finally found that phrase being used again and again in virtually identical, uh, identical terms as Paul uses them. So they do have that primary meaning that refers to the Old Covenant ceremonial signs and sacraments which served as signs pointing Israel to its weakness and need for grace in the Messiah. But I would argue that in Romans 2, what Paul envisions there is those Gentiles who do the law that is written on their hearts. That is, those Gentiles who, as Cranfield and many of the top evangelical commentators like Dunn and others interpret this this text, It's referring not to simply the conscience that pre- or unbelieving Gentiles have, but to those Gentiles who now are in the New Covenant and who have the Holy Spirit and thus the ability to keep the law. And this would explain why the covenant signs, the ceremonial rituals of the New Covenant, point to the ability that man now has by virtue of Christ's gift in the Spirit to keep the moral law. Not easily, but it's possible. So I would suggest then that in Romans 2, verse 4, he's not dealing with a hypothetical case. He's talking about a real judgment, or actually verse 6. For he will render to every man according to his works to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. He doesn't say he would have given eternal life to anybody who had done that, but nobody did it. No, because there are Gentiles as well as Jews who have the new covenant graces to keep that. And he goes on to say, But for those who are factious and do not obey the truth, but obey wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. So, in other words, works can be spoken of in a twofold sense. You have the ceremonial signs of the old covenant like circumcision, 
and man's inability to keep the moral law, which those ceremonies signify, but you also have the ceremonial signs of the new covenant, like baptism, which enable man to keep the moral law, both Jews and Gentiles in Christ. And so works can have that larger meaning. And later on in other texts of Romans and Galatians, in fact, it does. Works does apply not only to those things that don't justify, but to those things which justification bring forth. Now Dr. Hahn will ask his first question. I discussed Paul's use of Genesis 15.6 and Romans 4, where Paul would be taking the text out of context if he used it with reference to the moment that Abraham first began believing, and hence the moment when he was first justified. Since it can't refer to that first step or stage, but rather to a point in the middle of a life time ongoing process, then it would seem as though Paul's notion of justification is processive and not just punctiliar. It's ongoing. It's not just a past event. And hence his argument seems to point forward to the fact that Abraham wasn't circumcised until after he was declared justified. In Genesis 17, he's circumcised. He's declared just in 15. And so in effect, it would fit the standard view of Jerome and Augustine and St. Thomas, but it would seem to violate the sense given to it by Martin Luther. I was hoping you'd ask me that question, (laughs) actually. (laughs) I've been spending some time thinking about it, and it's funny that you should mention Martin Luther, because Martin Luther took notice of this very point in his commentary on Romans. Uh, He pointed out this very fact that Paul uh, is uh, quoting Genesis 15, but Abraham was a believer in Genesis 12, 13, and 14. And he deduced from this that Paul is not uh, speaking only of the moment uh, indicated in Genesis 15, uh, verse 6, but is speaking of a general universal principle or truth about the fact that Abraham was justified by faith throughout his life, not just Uh, at the first moment that he believed, not just at this particular moment in chapter 15, uh, not just later when he was willing to sacrifice his son in chapter 22, but throughout his life as a believer, from Genesis 12 through the end of his life, Abraham was justified not by his works, but consistently and all the way from faith to faith. So Luther's own understanding uh, of this passage takes into account uh, the concern that you raise And I would just say that the problem uh, is there are, of course, there are Protestants, and I admit this, who have looked at this verse and said, this is the moment when Abraham first receives uh, justification, when he is uh, uh, first established as a believer. And I agree with you that Hebrews 11, verse 8, flatly disproves that. Uh, Abraham, by faith, went out uh, to a land that he didn't know and so forth. Uh, That that clearly is referring to Genesis 12 and that Abraham had faith at that point. So when Protestants uh, have taken this verse uh, out of context in that regard, I agree with you. But the Protestant confessions and the Protestant doctrine of justification historically is not a mere punctiliar sense, as you're talking about. You're justified only at that particular moment uh, when you first believe, but you are justified throughout your life by faith from start to finish. That justification is not simply a one-time event that happens in the past in your life, but it is a status that you enjoy as a believer from that moment until the end of your life and for eternity. So that the Protestant would simply turn this around and say, yes, you're right, this isn't the first moment in which Paul is justified, when, in which Abraham was justified, but it is one of the moments at which his status was declared to be a status of right standing before God not on the basis of his works, not on the basis of something he did for God, but on the basis of something God did for him, something that God promised to do for him. And so he says in verse 4 of Romans 4, Now to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as what is due. And then verse 5, But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. And then he goes on to give a second witness. You know, in Jewish law, you always have to have two witnesses to prove anything. And Paul has two witnesses from the Old Testament for his doctrine of justification 
by faith. The first is Abraham. That's the main, test, the main witness. But he has a second witness, and that's David, who says in uh, verse 7, he's quoted in verse 7 here from Psalm 32, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds, lawless works, have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the person whose sin the Lord will not take into account. So David is, say, David is saying he is thanking God that he does not count his sin against him, that he forgives him of his sins, uh, his lawlessness, his lawless deeds, and that God reckoned David righteous apart from his works. Abraham, likewise, though he was a believer from Genesis 12 on, was a sinner from Genesis 12 on. We see him lying about his wife and trying to cover up, uh, cover his tracks in that regard and, and doing other things that were inappropriate. He was never able to justify himself by his works. His relationship to God was never based on his having performed certain works, but based on the fact that he was a believer in God, the one who trusted in God and believed in his promises. Now, Professor Bowman will ask his second question. I'm going to uh, turn in a little bit different direction now and ask you a very different sort of question. I've observed that converts out of the Roman Catholic Church to evangelical Protestantism, such as myself, almost always leave the Catholic Church, frankly, because we didn't find the gospel there. We didn't find Christ's saving grace and love in the Catholic Church, even though we were raised in it, even though we were baptized, even though I personally went to confession and received the Eucharist. I didn't know Christ when I was a Catholic. And when I found Christ, it was through the ministry of the Word preached by Protestants. The reverse is almost never the case. I've yet to meet a, an ex-evangelical Protestant who's become a Roman Catholic because he couldn't find Christ in the Presbyterian Church or the Baptist Church, but he found it in the Catholic Church. Do you see this pattern as well? And if so, how do you account for it? I was hoping. Yes, I was hoping you would ask that question. <laughs> I would say that uh, one noticeable difference between our situations is that you didn't have Christ when you left and you found him on the outside. I not only had Christ on the outside, but I opposed what was on the inside of the Catholic Church based upon misunderstandings. And the more I studied Christ and the more I applied myself to the Word, the more I discovered the fullness of the faith that Christ gave to his people was to be found in the Catholic Church. At the same time, I should say that in pastoring Protestant churches, I had the sad experience of seeing people who grew up in believing families, but who had eyes but couldn't see and ears that couldn't hear. I don't know what it was, whether it was rebellious adolescence or just simply uh, uh, grace withheld. In any case, you can see in both church contexts people who grow up and hear the gospel but don't really hear it. I would suggest that you can't go to Mass without reciting the Nicene Creed on Sunday and without hearing the gospel proclaimed in a profound summary expression. And then to see the gospel renewed as the covenant Christ ratified is celebrated in the Holy Eucharist. But I have seen in the Catholic Church people who have eyes but don't see, ears that don't hear, just as I saw that in the, in the Protestant Church. What I would see then is simply this, that you have needy people in both places, and that you've got the Holy Spirit working in both places. I would say that there are many people today who could testify to having grown up in evangelical churches without a conversion experience, without ever hearing the gospel in a way that they found compelling or converting. I would also say that if you took Catholics who've left and now have become ex-Catholics and you went back over the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist, the various scriptural readings that they sat there listening to, the various creeds that they recited, the prayers that they intoned, you would ask them, did you actually hear what you would now call the gospel or not? 
And I think you'd have to say, yes, I heard it, but it just didn't register. It just didn't sink in. It just didn't manifest itself in converting power. So I would say that the phenomenon is not unmixed. It's a, it's a mixed bag, and it cuts both ways. But I would also think that it's significant that uh, an organization like the Coming Home Network has been founded with well over a hundred former Protestant ministers who at various times counted themselves not only non-Catholic, but at various shades of being anti-Catholic, who are now, having studied the Bible and have come into the church, what they would consider themselves to be evangelical Bible Christian Catholics. They, they haven't left behind what they had. They have brought it into the Catholic Church where they find it reaching a kind of super abundant fulfillment. Here's the second question you were hoping I'd ask. I mentioned, and I'd like your comment on something I, I said in the talk, and that is the only time the Holy Spirit inspired a New Testament writer to use the phrase faith alone was in James 2.24 where he said, a man is justified by works and not by faith alone, using Abraham and saying in verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac upon the altar? Obviously a work that was wrought by God a work that was rewarded by God, but God was only crowning his work in Abraham. But would you comment upon this and answer this question? If the only time the Holy Spirit inspired a New Testament writer to use the phrase faith alone, he used it to deny it, should this really be the material principle on which the church is divided? Well, thank you for that, for that question. Uh, uh, let me say that my first response would be, sing, be simply to be say, I can't talk. Oh, it would simply to say, be to say that the biblical terminology will not always convert over into our systematic theological usages, and I'll give you a good example. Uh, the Bible never says that God is three persons, and in fact, at least in some translations in Hebrews chapter 1, it refers to God as if God were one person. Uh, in fact, the Greek word hypostasis, which is used in uh, Catholic and Protestant theology to refer to the three persons of the Trinity is used in the singular in Hebrews chapter 1 with reference to the nature of God. Does that mean we should stop calling God three persons? I don't think so. I think we have to think carefully about why we're using the terminology that we're using, make sure that we're being clear, as you pointed out, and then go ahead and use the terminology that best works whether or not it happens to fit every example or every usage of the word or phrase in the Bible or not. Uh, if the meanings that we're attributing to these words, conveying through these words, is faithful to the whole Bible, uh, then we're doing our job. Now, in James chapter 2, to go more specifically to the passage, in James chapter 2, James is not trying to deny that it is faith that secures our relationship to God in salvation. Uh, to go right to the beginning of this particular passage, James chapter 2, verse 14, James says, What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? And the way James words the question here makes it very clear that he's not talking about people who have faith in the sense that Paul would mean it, faith that really clings to Jesus Christ and really is united to Jesus Christ in in uh, trust and putting one's confidence in Christ, but it is a person who claims to have faith. If a man says he has faith, but he has no works. And then that question, can that faith save him, implies, no, that faith, this particular faith that we're talking about, won't do the job. There is a faith that will. There is a faith that will. It's the faith that, in fact, Paul talks about, and that's the faith that trusts in Jesus Christ, not merely gives lip service to Jesus Christ. How can you tell, empirically speaking, experientially, if people are really trusting in Jesus Christ? I agree with James. You can tell because of the way they treat other people, the way, especially the way they treat Christians. But James is not denying that faith saves, or that faith is the key, the sole instrument through which we experience the saving grace of God in our lives. He is saying that faith, that's real faith, will issue forth in the good works. It will mature and be completed in good works, as he goes on to say in verse 22. But he's not saying that the faith uh, does not make that connection, 
that the faith is somehow incomplete to actually establish our relationship to God as justified until we do the works. It's, some uh, Protestants, of course, have different understandings about the precise nuance of the word justified in these verses. Uh, that's, a, I think, a very uh, difficult question because there are different ways of reading it. We've got really two or three different words we have to worry about. Faith, works, justified. Uh, what, you know, there's several different possible nuances, but I think the main point James is making is clear. It's what Protestants are attempting to affirm in their confessions when they say, as I quoted the Westminster Confession of Faith, saying that we are justified by faith alone as the sole instrument of our justification, but that faith is never alone, but issues forth in precisely the kind of good works that James is talking about. Now Professor Bowman will ask his third and final question. I had four, and I have to eliminate one, so there's no way to roll them up into one question either. Scott, I know that you believe in a very robust notion and concept of the sovereignty of God, as I do. God is in control of his creation. He's in control of his church. And yet we do have these schisms in different denominations in the church. Wouldn't you agree that God has a purpose, that he's working out through the schisms that the church has suffered, and that, in fact, we needed to kind of get broken up a little bit so that we can learn from each other, so we can bring different perspectives like the ones that we are bringing today to the table so that we can actually grow toward a greater and more uh, s s solidly established maturity as one church than would have been possible if we had remained organizationally and institutionally one as we were a thousand years ago. Wouldn't you say that the sovereignty of God and the sovereignty of Jesus Christ over his church demands that we recognize that? And if so, what are some of the things that you think Catholics specifically might be able to learn from Protestants? Yes, of course, I do believe that God is still in control and sovereignly allowed this sort of thing to happen, and it didn't catch him by surprise. And I do think that he has a purpose for it, but that the purpose has not yet been realized because the purpose is nothing less than repentance on both sides and a reunification as well. And until that purpose is realized, we've got to be careful not to allow what God sovereignly permits to serve as an excuse for continuing the separation. If this great reformational split proves to be nothing more than a long separation of bed and board and not a divorce and remarriage, I will dance a jig. However, I would say this, that God sovereignly permits great tragedies. The greatest tragedy he ever permitted was the cross, out of which he sovereignly brought the greatest good in human history. This split in the 1500s is arguably one of the greatest tragedies in the history of the church, and I do hold out divine hope, hope in God, that some greater good than we can possibly imagine might come from this, but I hope it doesn't fall short of bringing back into the fullness of the Catholic faith those people who recognize the primacy of faith and end up exaggerating that primacy by using an expression that suggests its exclusivity, that faith is alone. You mentioned earlier that justification is a status, and I agree with that and with Luther, but I would only add that it's a status of sonship, as Trent defined justification, God declares us to be sons because his spirit has recreated us as children of God. Sonship is a lived reality which matures as a life process. That is why, on the one hand, justification is an ongoing status, but on the other hand, it's also an ongoing process. Now, as far as sola fide is concerned, I would suggest that we be careful not to have systematic theology define terms like justification in such a way as to take Paul and to pit him against James. In other words, if our systematic theology ends up with a definition of the word justification which would be contradicted by James or which would exclude James, then we don't need to subordinate James. We need to go back and redefine our systematic terms. And I would suggest that in Catholic systematic theology, the definition given to justification fits perfectly well 
with complete and compelling harmony with both Paul and James. Now, you're right that the scriptures never affirm three persons, but they never deny three persons either. James 2.24 doesn't simply fail to affirm faith alone, it denies it. That spirit-inspired utterance is what leads me to say that this tragic division was unnecessary and inappropriate. But I would say the greater need right now is for Catholic Christians to immerse themselves in two things, in God and His Word, and in the people of God who love His Word but are outside the church. And if this dialogue, if this, if this line of questioning can provoke Catholics as well as evangelical Protestants to become Bible Christians together, searching for the truth of God's Word in Romans as well as James, then the purpose for our gathering will be served. But I want to say one more thing about this because I really believe that God has a lot of Catholics here today because he wants to launch a revolution. And if it's not going to happen here, where is it going to happen? In the Bible Belt, where you're surrounded by brothers and sisters who love your Christ and who read your word and who study it and share it with other people generously. If you Catholic brothers and sisters don't do it here, where? If not now, when? If not on an occasion like this, what will provoke you to pour yourself out into the Bible? And so, to answer your question, I'm going to use it as a <laughs> springboard for one last exhortation. Dive in. Dive into the Scriptures, guided by the teachings of the Magisterium, according to sound principles of interpretation, but dive in, fearlessly, with a childlike confidence and joy, it's our birthright as Christians. Doctor, doc, please, if we could just hold applause till the end. That is, uh, maybe some of you weren't here when we gave introductory remarks, but if you could hold your applause till we're completely finished discussing the issue, thank you. Dr. Hahn will give his third and final question. We spoke about Christ's righteousness in justification. And the term in Greek, dikaiosune, dikaiosis, comes from the Greek root for righteousness. The question raised in your presentation was, is this righteousness imputed only, or is it also imparted? And the Westminster Confession, which you quoted, says that it is legally imputed, and only imputed. It is not imparted. We remain sinful. I would like you to comment on this. Since... God the Holy Spirit has already made that justified, faithful sinner a new creation through regeneration, a child of God with the very life of God within his soul. Infused divine life is now his. So when he imputes Christ's righteousness, it seems like he's imputed what he's already imparted. He's declaring something he's already done. God can't declare something, in fact, without doing it. The, uh, the answer to that is that in the Westminster Confession of Faith and in Protestant uh, theology generally, the point is that although there is both a work of imputation or reckoning of Christ's righteousness to us and a new birth which gives us the life of Christ by his spirit in us which enables us, as you eloquently uh, spoke about in your opening statement to keep the law of God, to obey God, and keep his commandments, these are to be distinguished in this way. Our standing, our status as children, our acceptance by God into his adopted family of sons and daughters is not based on, grounded on, or dependent upon our performing the good works that flow from that new life in Christ. But rather, it's the other way around. Our producing those good works in Christ, our experiencing and living out His love, issues forth from a relationship with God that is secure because it's based on what God has done in Christ 
not what we are going to do for Christ. In other words, our justification is a settled matter precisely so that we will then go on to love God and to love our brothers and sisters and to love those who need to know Christ freely out of hearts filled with compassion and love and joy, not because we are attempting to salvage, shore up, buttress, uh, or otherwise uh, maintain our status as children of God. I do, you have emphasized eloquently, I think, in many of your uh, presentations, including today, the aspect of the Christian life as a life of family, that salvation is a matter of coming into a family. My children's status as my children does not depend on their performance, even though they are not merely my children in legal status, but they are children, they share my nature, they have the capacity to learn to do the kinds of things I would like them to do, but their status as children is never dependent on their performance. It's dependent on my having given them that life in the first place and my having given them that status at the same time. We, it's, uh, it, sometimes people don't understand why this is so important. I'm trying to make this as clear as I can. If you believe that your continuing status as a child of God is dependent on your performance, then you will never be really sure that you're a child of God in the first place. And I have to tell you that in my experience, most Roman Catholics I know, and this may not apply to you, Scott, but most Roman Catholics I know aren't sure if they're going to live forever with Christ. They hope so, they say. They think so, they may say. But they're not sure. And the reason why they're not sure is because they figure God grades on a curve. And they're not sure which side of the bell curve they're going to land up on. Now, this is arguably a misunderstanding of Catholic doctrine, but it's a natural one once you make justification dependent, even in part, on works. And that's why we maintain as Protestants that our justified standing with God is based on His gracious work in us, established and linked to Him by faith and not by anything that we do, and that it is in that status, in enjoying that relationship, that we can then go on to freely do what God has called us to do as his children. Thank you, Dr. Hahn and Professor Bowman. Now, Dr. Hahn will have five minutes to give a closing statement. The Council of Trent defined justification as a translation from that state in which man is born a child of the first Adam through the state of grace and of adoption of the sons of God through the second, Jesus Christ. In a word, justification is, according to the Catholic Church's teaching and the teaching of Paul and James, the Father's gift of sonship, Christ's own sonship, and no other sonship. So we are in Christ and stand before the Father with that confidence which is ours through the spirit of sonship. This fact has been neglected by Protestants who attack the church almost as much as it's been neglected by Catholics who have been attacked. But I would suggest, suggest to you that Catholics are the ones probably less aware of the distinctive emphasis and beauty of the Council of Trent's teaching in distilling the essence of the New Testament's proclamation. In fact, one of the greatest theologians in our history, Matthias Joseph Shaben, a, a theologian about whom I spoke with Cardinal Ratzinger last month, we both have a great admiration for this 19th century figure who many regard as the greatest Catholic theologian in the 19th century. He said this, For this reason, the Council of Trent, when propounding the true nature of justification, could confine itself to the statement that it's a transference from a state in which man is born a son of the first Adam to the state of grace and adoption and divine sonship in God's family. Sheban goes on, in these words, the council singles out the element that imparts to Christian justification its supernatural 
mysterious character. We must cling to these words and make them our point of departure if we would appreciate the full excellence of justification. If all the theologians had done this, the notion of justification would have escaped the shallow and muddled treatment that has so often disfigured it. And I would add, this approach would explain the church's teaching about assurance. Because a son's status in the family depends upon the gift of life, but the gift of growing in that life. And there's always the prodigal son who was away for a long time. And when he came back, what did the father say? You were lost, but you're now found. You were dead, but you're now alive. Because that life of divine sonship is not just a legal decree, it's a lived reality which we are free to kill, to go to the marital covenant. I have a friend who has said to me repeatedly in the last six months, I still love my wife, I just love this other woman, this other woman more. Well, how do you think this wife of his feels about that? Oh, well, as long as you keep still consenting to love me, it doesn't really matter. No, you can sin so grievously so murderously against a covenant bond of life that you can effectively kill it. Do we have assurance? Yes. It's the assurance of hope in God's power, in God's mercy, and in God's word. Is that the same certainty of faith that I have that Jesus is the Son of God? No. Scripture says Jesus is the Son of God. Scripture does not say Scott Hahn is going to heaven. I wish it did. So I put my faith in the proposition that Jesus is the Son of God, and I put my hope in Christ's power to save me. So it's the assurance of hope that keeps us from the presumption of false certainty or the despair of doubt. And that is what a spouse and a child share in the family, along with the freedom and the responsibility. In sum, what we're talking about is what brings the greatest glory to God if He is an eternal Father. God who fathers His sons and daughters by imparting to them not just forgiveness, but His own power, His own life, His own divine being so that we can be divinized. We can be made partakers of the divine nature as 2 Peter 1.4 declares. Nothing less is the gospel and nothing less will do to enable us to live the life that we have as children of God. Thank you. Now Professor Bowman will give his closing statement and we'll have five minutes. Scott, I consider you my brother in Christ, and I'm really glad for this opportunity to have had the exchange that we've had. I've uh, noticed in uh, preparing for this uh, uh, dialogue and uh, listening to some of Dr. Hahn's tapes and in talking with him on the telephone, and again uh, just now in his uh, closing remarks, uh, that Dr. Hahn bases his view of the church's teaching on salvation, the Roman Catholic doctrine of salvation, almost exclusively on the Council of Trent, not on the more recent statements found especially in the Second Vatican Council's documents. And although, of course, Vatican II affirms the validity of what Trent taught, I and many other Protestant observers of the Roman Catholic Church and some People inside the Roman Catholic Church as well, I must hasten to add, are concerned that at Vatican II, the Church at least moved in the direction of letting slip one thing that Trent was very clear on, and that was that there is no salvation outside the faith of Jesus Christ, that there is no possibility of salvation except through Jesus Christ. In uh, many observers' opinion, the Roman Catholic Church in this country, maybe especially, but worldwide, is becoming increasingly dominated not by the uh, very warm and pious and uh, much more biblically-based Tridentine understanding of Catholicism that Dr. Hahn represents, but by the more liberal, if you want to use that term, or neo-Orthodox, or pushing toward a universalistic understanding of Christianity as found, for example, by Karl Rahner and other major Roman Catholic theologians, 
whose view basically has encouraged the idea among many Catholics that salvation is extended to people of all religions almost indiscriminately and that what really counts is whether you're sincere. Now again, if you study the documents carefully, sincerity shouldn't be considered enough, but nevertheless, this is a natural understanding of the direction that the Catholic Church's teaching has been taking. taking. And many Catholics, in fact, think this way. Many Catholic priests think this way. This concerns me much more than the disagreements that Scott and I have over the precise relationship between justification, faith, works, and grace. Because at least we both agree that the only hope of salvation that a person can be offered is to place their faith in Jesus Christ. This is something that many Roman Catholics are beginning to let slip, and I would maintain that they are actually being encouraged to do so now by some of the teachings that have been promulgated by the Roman Catholic Church. Let me say in closing that I would highly recommend that you do study this issue further from different points of view. Uh, there are good uh, materials from both sides that are present here. One book that I'd like to recommend is a book by Norman Geisler and Ralph McKenzie. Ralph is here with us today called Roman Catholics and Evangelicals, Agreements and Disagreements. One thing I like about this book is they set out the, the agreements fully and fairly as well as disagreements. And one of the things that they bring out in this book I think is worth quoting in, in, in closing. This is a quotation from Ralph Martin, who's a Catholic leader in this country. Ralph Martin says, As hard as it may be to face many Catholics who have left the Catholic Church to become part of a vital Protestant congregation may have gone to hell if they stayed unconverted and with virtually no Christian support in the Catholic Church. That's a Catholic who's saying that. And he's right. And I'm one of the persons who had to leave because I found Christ preached more faithfully and clearly. Yes, you can find it if you really study the catechisms and the liturgy carefully and you're paying attention and you're looking at the right, but the clear exposition of the gospel I found in evangelical Protestantism. Many other Catholics have had the same experience. My exhortation to you who are Catholics is preach the gospel of Jesus Christ as the only Savior of the world and that people cannot have any assurance of God's love and grace in their lives unless they put their trust in Jesus Christ alone. Thank you. Let's give both Dr. Hahn and Professor Bowman a round of applause. Thank you.